the title is the nature of uh, data and it touches upon a central point of this discussion series because it asks uh, what are data uh, what is their nature um, are they are data a direct measurement or a representation and uh, as and is the nature of data objective or subjective or both of them uh, and uh, it is also a divided contributes to reinforce these ontological, epistemological, and methodological barriers across the disciplines and research methods that um, um, that are part of the, that are um, the central focus of this uh, series. So the topic on the nature of data is, of course, uh, vast and even elusive. But today we will try to uh, address the, to these and and some other questions that will uh, come up during the discussion. Thanks to the two panelists uh, we have uh, for today. So we have uh, Federica Russo, who is a philosopher of science, technology, and information and the university, at the University of Amsterdam, um, as well as uh, a member of the management team uh, at the Institute of Advanced Studies, uh, who uh, is also the host of this discussion series. And then we have uh, Lasse uh, Herritz, who is currently a professor at the Institute of uh, Institute for Housing and Urban Development Studies at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. They are also together with me, the core organizers of the series. So it will be like uh, an internal, uh, internally managed session today. But I will give now the word to uh, the two panelists, um, starting from, from Federica for their pitch. Yeah, okay, thanks. So let me share my screen and we'll be with you in a second. And um, can you see my screen okay? Okay, perfect. Uh, yes. Thanks uh, very much for uh, this opportunity to share some ideas. Uh, about uh, da data and especially the, the nature of data. The question is highly philosophical in character. And so I thought uh, I should try to say something meaningful to you. And I thought the first thing I wanted to tell, to start with is uh, this uh, adagio, if you torture the data long enough, it will, will, it will confess. It is a quote attributed to uh, economist Rodal Coase, but uh, uh, independently of who actually said that, it became a kind of uh, uh, a mantra in scientific, methodological, and also philosophical circles. And as it often happens, when you say things uh, uh, repeatedly enough, they nearly become uh, uh, true. And that's a bit uh, kind of a dangerous uh, position to, to hold. And I want to take a uh, stake with, uh, with this uh, position that you have to torture data. So what do you actually need in order to torture data? First of all, you have to take data as being out there somehow. They are out there, you take them, and then you manipulate them in various ways. You torture them incredibly hard, and finally you can extract the inner truth that is in the data. And as you can imagine, I'm, I will be trying to take issue especially with the first uh, statement, namely the data is out there. Of course, I, I would have uh, uh, things to say also about the other two points, and they, <laughs> this uh, uh, would probably follow from the first. So let me concentrate on what it means that data has to be out there. And it is something that we already discussed in the previous uh, two sessions, something that we questioned and we problematized. To cut the long story short, the position should be that data is constructed. It is not objectively out there as if you can really take it uh, as a, an object, but uh, there is an element of construction that is quite important. So I'm not saying anything new until now, really. Um, this may make a lot of sense if you think of social science context, because interviews, surveys are ways in which you generate the data that, uh, um, that, you, that we then analyze. So this element of construction is quite easily uh, understood and acknowledged in social science circles. 
But I was, I was trying to make this point in an earlier session that, uh, well, the natural sciences do not escape this element of construction either. If you think of uh, highly technologized fields such as high energy physics, I mean, data is not out there in any simple way. It takes a lot of theory, machinery, experiments, all you name it, in order to get the data of the collisions of the particles in the large uh, Hadron Collider. And then you may be tempted to say, oh, but data is constructed because it is the specificity of these uh, fields that uh, they really make up uh, the data because of the sophisticated uh, infrastructure. And this is where I would say, well, not quite. Um, even uh, admitting that uh, Newton had this idea really with the uh, simple uh, observation of an apple falling from the tree, even then the, um, the data has an important element of construction and that comes, for instance, from a certain theoretical uh, background that we may use. And here I'm, I'm using kind of the two extremes, the social sciences and the natural sciences. And it would be most interesting to, to hear uh, the views of colleagues working in the humanities, I'm thinking of cultural analysis, I'm thinking of a computational history of ideas, where in some sense, they have something out there, like visual um, um, objects, uh, text, but still what we would then call data is not just out there in the image or in the text. So there is this idea of construction that needs quite some, uh, some further specification. But I haven't said anything yet about what is a data. I said it is constructed, but I haven't said what it is. Is it a number? Is it an object? Is it a specimen? What it is that we are really talking about? That is the question of, uh, of the nature. And here I will uh, uh, bring in just one idea from the philosophy of information, namely the idea, uh, the fact that you can understand data as lack of uniformity, as a trace or a sign that marks a difference with respect to something else. And so once you have this lack of uniformity, this trace, you start semanticizing it, you give meaning to it, and then it becomes information. And um, philosopher Luciano Freud will forgive me for condensing in a, just one sentence something that uh, he takes pain to explain in long chapters, what is this process of semanticization and giving meaning uh, to data so that they become information. But you, I hope you can get kind of the gist of, of the idea that it is in this lack of uniformity that we have the data. What is the advantage is that um, if you have this view on data, many, very many things can be data. By samples, images, interviews, specimens, recordings of particle collisions, all these things can be considered data once the kind of rough material undergoes this process of semantization, of giving meaning, uh, etc. Uh, and for those of you who are um, uh, familiar with um, the, uh, the literature and information, if this evokes to you the idea that uh, information is a difference which make a difference, yes, it is very much in line with that, very close to that. Possibly it is, is a slightly different way of expressing the same uh, view. But um, why, does it, uh, why does it matter? Why does it matter that we take this uh, uh, perspective uh, um, on data that is in a sense minimally committal to what data is? So it's not number, it is not just an object, but something that can uh, embrace all of these things. It, it matters because once you think of data, uh, you have to think about the relation between data and us. What do I mean by that? So we said that data is not out there as a cherries on a tree is for us to pick. Data is constructed, but this doesn't mean that it's all arbitrary and uh, uh, subjective. The way I would phrase it is the following. We epistemic agents engage with the world and data comes out of this engagement and it is but the first step in the long process of knowledge production. Who are these epistemic agents? All of us, social scientists, natural scientists, computer scientists, you name who is busy with the data. 
and what is this engaging with the world any kind of techno scientific practice in any given domain and of course you have to go through the dirty kind of exercise of spelling out the details but that's all to say that if you work with this idea of construction of data and this relation to data then we certainly move away from the torturing thing which is a kind of barbarian in these days and possibly we can do better when spelling out what it means and i am done thank you for your attention Thank you, Federica. Really well, well done in terms of time. <laughs> seven, seven minutes and a half sharp. I will uh, now give the word to uh, Lasse for his speech before we uh, open the discussion to everybody. Yeah, thanks all. And uh, I, I come from a very different angle from Federica, so bear with me when I uh, talk about this little story that uh, some time ago I visited Scrap, it's a store that sells recyclable materials. And I stumbled upon across, uh, um, stumbled across a big box of old cassette tapes, and they were mostly unmarked, they were basically gathering dust, and it seems no one was interested in them. I will show you the young kids in the audience today what a cassette looks like. Back in the days when you had to work to listen to music, back in the days when streaming was something that only water did. So out of curiosity, I bought the box for a couple of euros and back home, I uh, put it in my old cassette player from the 1980s, which I then hooked up uh, using a wire to my digital recorder from the early old, so I could convert the tapes into digital files, which I could then listen to and could also manipulate, which is what I was basically after. The tapes, as it turned out, were recordings of a, of a series of conferences from the 1970s about parapsychology, um, aura reading, extrasensory perception, all that kind of stuff. There was a guy who claimed that his piezoelectric equipment could measure super, supernatural energy fields. Uh, there was someone else who started by saying that his speech was going to be so intense that people were free to leave the room if it was too much. And then he went on and delivered something that must have been one of the most boring speeches I've heard in a long time. The most interesting bit was at the end of each tape, as the presentations had ended and the room was just chatting about other things. You know how it goes. Apparently, the tape recorder just kept running and I could eavesdrop on many conversations in the room. So uh, one example was a male voice close to the microphone whispering, uh, why don't we meet after dinner? Upon which a female voice whispered back, I don't want my husband to see you. So a little drama from the 1970s, captured on tape, played on 1980s equipment, re-recorded on digital equipment from the early aughts, and then listened to me, listened back to me um, in uh, in 2022, basically spying something that happened 45 years ago. Now, why is this relevant for the topic of today? Um, it is because I believe that it signifies what data is. Now, I'm not a philosopher, unlike Federica. I was not smart enough. So I'm rather someone who actually needs to work with data in the real world. And by definition, this data is incomplete, ambiguous, uh, highly recursive. And the, 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 the whole act of constructing data and constructing data sets involves so much human manual labor in terms of collecting, measurement, interpretation, coding, categorization, scaling, that uh, as Federica just said, I cannot see this as an object separate of human agency. All this data passes through our hands. Um, we process it, uh, we assign meaning, we, we, and we do that by taking cues from the context under which we work and live. Um, when I listen to people claiming that they can measure supra natural beings using piezoelectric equipment, then I'm, I'm skeptical because I have the knowledge of today. So as such, I very much agree with Sophia's point uh, two weeks ago uh, when she said that we need to maintain a close relationship to the data. You have to understand the object rather than treating it as a set of numbers on the screen. And I would also agree with what John uh, said uh, two weeks ago that Interpreted data, which is inevitable anyway, is basically adding data to data, so building a stratum of data. The entire act of working with data uh, means that data is not a part or a property of something out there that we can access directly, but rather a core reef of stacked data, layers of data stacked upon the other, which we then somehow make fit to do an analysis that renders outcomes that may make sense. Uh, Federica referred to it as torturing. Um, I think we have. We have relatively solid tools that, that can help us with that. <laughs> so in a roundabout way, um, this takes us a little bit closer to what uh, data may be. And while we may see the world as consisting of data, and I do, it 
effect consists of vectors because we can't separate one piece of data, whatever it may be, from another piece that is intrinsically linked to it. For example, through our interpretation, our ability or our inability to see the one thing related to the other. As Mitley says, we live at the edge of an alien world. We're only starting to scratch the surface of what we know. Can we then say something about the nature of data? Well, yes, at the surface level, we can say that data is a form of information that we can process to assess theories and make predictions about the real world. But that is just a definition. That's a Wikipedia definition and does not answer the question for me. But if we accept that complex social reality is developmentally open and that there is therefore a continuous interaction between uh, an object of interest and its environment, an interac interaction that gives rise to social structures, emergence in other words, then we need to accept that the data we observe and collect are just remote proxies for the actual object, the actual object that we wish to understand. And I find it critical, I find it inevitable that we adopt here a critical realist ontology that forefronts the difference between the ob object, the intransitive domain in which resides the object's mechanisms and events, and our knowledge of the object as obtained through the observations made available to us. Transitive domain that centers on the uh, on our experience of the object. And taking such a stratified take on reality uh, explains the experience of at least many social scientists that there are many ways in which one can approximate the same object. Uh, hence my earlier point about vector spaces, about the coral reefs, um, but never really fully get the object. And this is a social science perspective, and I would be really happy to listen to the other pe people from, uh, sorry, the people from other disciplines today in the audience if they would agree or disagree with that. Either way, as much as researchers may look for commonalities between objects as if they are disembodied, decontextualized unit, it is their diversity that forms the biggest empirical puzzle. I find it super interesting that Federica also mentioned that because we did not coordinate our talks, we're coming from very different angles, but we have arrived at more or less the same point there. Interpretation, reimagination, they continue to be important in our understanding of data as vectors and the vector space that they built uh, in very much the similar uh, way that when I fired up my old cassette player and the digital recorder to eavesdrop on this uh, secretive little uh, rendezvous in the aftermath of a conference on parapsychology some 45 years ago. So handling data to me is building vectors in an attempt to understand better what the object could be like and how it has to emerge or to understand how it has emerged, but it is approximation. And I wish that this is a discussion that we have much more often, especially in the realm of the complexity sciences, that features so many advanced models and techniques, yet rarely discusses the nature of the, of the data, the data that sits between the object and the observation. And I think that's, that's unfortunate because uh, we're so good at building models and we're so good at developing te techniques, yet um, we, it's, it's a, the application to especially social objects is relatively crude and could gain much from such a, from such a conversation. So that is my little kickoff for now and uh, I'll give it back to Sofia now. Yeah, thanks a lot. Lasso was very punctual in terms of time. Um, if I, I, I had to. I mean, Federica set, set the bar very high. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yes. Um, if I may uh, summarize a bit uh, the key points that you, that you proposed, uh, uh, we have first, uh, 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 I mean, the first point is that we, uh, that data do not exist independently from us, so that they need us to be there in a way, but also that there is a reality out there uh, according to critical realism, and we can only have a partial knowledge of it through our uh, imperfect approximation that are data. So that uh, it is uh, yeah, both on, basically it's a, a acknowledge, acknowledgement of, of the limits of our, our uh, efforts to, um, to know reality. But on the other hand, I think that there is, we also have the inability to consider data um, as part of this relationship. So we have kind of to objectify them because we can, and we have to, to make our models and uh, even from a complexity, uh, complexity from, from this perspective. So we can talk about emergence and the links and all uh, even configurations, but we still have to objectify the data and we cannot make our models with, with ourselves inside in a way. So it uh, also tells uh, a lot about the, the, the limits of our knowledge because uh, yeah, we, we have to separate the data from us. Um, 
questions from the audience or remarks to uh, Federica and Lasse's um, talks. Powder. Uh, we cannot hear you now. Does this work? Yes, now it, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I just switched microphone quickly. Um, I was still juggling some thoughts, but I, I, I'm, I will try to, to, to articulate them a little bit. But uh, what I really liked about the talks is how well they supplement each other, because uh, I think Federica, or, um, um, I mean, I, I, I agree with the idea that data are constructed. Of course, there's always the trap that you take a very postmodernist view then, and that, you know, it's only constructions. And of course, you already said it's not, you know, just arbitrary construction, but I think this addition of critical realism, that there is a reality out there that we're sort of abstracting from, is really important because that allows still to say, um, you know, one one construction is better than another. So uh, you can still make some measurement, I guess, of good, good or bad data. And uh, you can actually also find out something about that. Another thing I wanted to say is, um, you, know, you talked about critical realism, Russell, but it also reminded me a lot of uh, uh, what a philosopher that uh, really inspired me uh, said, uh, uh, Alfred North Whitehead, so, um, even though I only partly, uh, ha ha not even half understand what he says usually. But he, he talks a lot about how every engagement with reality, so that goes a bit further than us as only as researchers. It also goes further than people engaging with reality. It, 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 he basically talks about anything. This is any engagement with reality is abstraction. So there is a reality out there outside of abstraction, but we can only you know, approach it uh, through abstractions. And I think that comes quite close to this critical realist view as well, right? So because uh, it means that you lose something, it means that different people or different things abstract in different ways. And also, again, uh, one abstraction can be more successful, I guess, uh, whatever that means, uh, than another. So th these are just some thoughts that came up. Yes, thank you, Wouter. Uh, Federica or Lasse, do you want to reply? Or? Yeah, maybe just uh, quickly, I, <clears throat> I uh, I'm glad that you that you talk about this uh, post modernity trap uh, that uh, we need to avoid. I, I didn't want to phrase this explicitly, but very often uh, in uh, in philosophy of science, it seems like that you are uh, stuck between uh, being a hard realist over a staunch ob uh, subjectivist. And uh, what these positions miss, and uh, of course I'm oversimplifying, is uh, the gray area in between uh, where the truth is that there is a, a reality out there, but it's not a totally objective nor totally uh, subjective, subjective. And that's exactly what I was trying to capture in uh, reflecting on what this const uh, construction means of the data. So you, you picked up uh, entirely. And it is uh, quite interesting that the critical realism stance is not a position uh, discussed by philosophers of science. I, I have to make myself a note every time that this is an interesting literature to look at because it is not part of our uh, normal background. M Melissa will tell us whether I'm right or not in, uh, in that, but a kind of mainstream philosophy of science really does not look into that, sadly enough. That's, that's quite interesting, actually. Uh, <laughs> so I, I will give the word to Melissa because maybe, uh, I don't know if, uh, well, well, you have your remark or question, but I don't know if you can also relate to, to what Federica said. Melissa. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I certainly um, <laughs> recognize this polarization or somehow that uh, uh, we have in philosophy uh, of science Critical realism, as far as I know, and it's also not something that I know much about, uh, it's perhaps because in philosophy, we kind of look down into that, or at least uh, in philosophy of economics, people don't take critical realists uh, very seriously because of the kind of the criticism that they have uh, made of economics on the basis of critical realism. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I can uh, say about that. I, I, I just had a question. Uh, uh, 
for Lasse, and that is that um, he somehow, I mean, he, you, you were not surprised to have uh, um, that there were points of agreement uh, with Federica, but uh, I was just wondering, okay, what what were you expecting somehow to, or why would you be expecting to disagree or to have disagreements about what the nature of data is? I kind of thought, okay, what could it be otherwise? Uh, so maybe this is just a matter of uh, of not knowing kind of the crowd uh, here or uh, yeah, some unfamiliarity. So that was my question. Thank you. Th thanks a lot. Um, I, I, that that actually is the answer. So I, um, I, I, I when I say surprised, I just thought it was interesting that you know if Erika comes from a very different angle, I'm I'm. I'm just pr doing practical research, and that somehow from those very different angles we have arrived to the same conclusions, which to me then says at least between Federica and me, we we have the same experiences, and therefore there must be at least some sort of truth in there. Uh, the other thing, the other reason why I'm always a bit um, cautious when I say these things is that, like Federica, I I'm, I I very often also end up with crowds that are either hardcore positivist or they are somewhere in uh, postmodernist Alice in Wonderland territory and that that I, I never know quite what where I where I'm going at and where I'm ending at and then when I drop a term and then some some people are, are scared away or they wholeheartedly disagree which is which is fine still of course so that's that's where the surprise comes from and I'm really happy you you raised that issue um, uh, for for two reasons one is we don't need to talk about white hat and I'm really happy about it because I don't understand a single thing what white hat wrote and the other thing is that I I like I like this idea I would like to know more about the idea that critical realism is sort of ignored or not considered or looked down upon and my take would be first of all there's no one critical realism school it is a hodgepodge of ideas and I mainly derive my ideas from Roy Bosco's work, but there are others who use the same term to do something that is quite different. So perhaps that is one reason why there are so many uh, disagreements about the, the added value of critical realism. Yet reading it and going through it and putting it together with my own practical experiences, I, I do find it very plausible. And my, mind you, uh, my, my training back was social constructivism. So I come from a world where everything was constructed. And sorry, that, that didn't work for me because it's not. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I just posed a question back. I have more questions, by the way. But one question I would like to pose to this group is then why, why did f critical realism fall by the wayside? Why is it not considered? Why am I alone? Except for who, of course. <laughs> Do you want me to give it a try, Sophia, in, uh, yeah. in like yes, 30 exactly. seconds? Yes. Um, <clears throat> so I think what you're asking for, Lasse, is a, <clears throat> a reconstruction of a very long and uh, rich uh, debate. So in, the way I see it is that uh, mainstream uh, philosophy of science has been uh, realist, basically, okay, or instrumentalist, okay? And then on the other side, you have the sociologist of science, so that kind of the camps that, that you come from, okay? And they have, they have really been in, in this opposition as if the problem was denying reality out there instead of trying to understand how we can make claims about the real world, okay? And then uh, I, there must be something about the uh, institutions in which they were active that may explain why people like Roy Bascar did not make it into mainstream uh, debates in philosophy of science and possibly not in sociology of science too. I have, uh, I have come across this literature when I was uh, reading social science methodology reflecting upon its own methods and, uh, and nature, okay? So I, I don't have an explanation why they haven't looked, but my intuition is that something at the level of social dynamics and groups and institutions has happened in there. And that's possibly why they haven't talked to each other. But intuitively, this is where I will find the most interesting claims because it doesn't force us to deny reality or to adhere that everything is subjective. Then the details are to be worked out. I don't know if that helps a bit, but. Very much so, absolutely. Thank you so much. Yes, thanks. Um, I, I will give the word to Rule. who has... No. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to both talks. And well, I also <clears throat> have a critical realist uh, take on, 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 on data and, and science. So 
Uh, Loss is certainly not alone in that sense. Um, but yeah, um, I'll also talk a lot to, well, people who are much more in the positivist, uh, we're much more in the positivist tradition. And I think that's where also Melissa's comment comes from, why uh, positivist and much of economic research is very positivist in nature, why they don't really like critical realism. Because when you take a critical realist view of data as at least partially socially constructed, uh, you cannot but quite strongly criticize all sorts of data analytical methods that really understand data as if they actually represent the world. So my question is sort of a kind of a practical one. How can you, in a sort of a polite way, talk to positivists, to economists, to sort of make them at least understand the questions that you've got about the way they look at data? Thanks, Raul. Um, who wants to reply between uh, Federica and Lasse? How, how can we be polite? <laughs> the group is bigger than us, right? We can ask other people too. <laughs> yeah, too but as you are the panelists first, yeah. The one question I ask economists uh, is simply, how did it work out for you then? And then they can explain to me how well the models did, did their predictions and how, how good it was. And, they quickly, we quickly run. I mean, I try to appreciate it, right? I try to appreciate it because I don't think that the, the, that they got it all wrong, not at all. But when when you talk to 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 people who are in that school, not just economists, but in general, um, they pull in all different kinds of um, limits that they are aware of but don't communicate anymore. Cetris paribus, or um, you know, myopic, the myopic nature of predictions and all that. And then when you slowly compile all those things together, you can see that that there's much understanding that there are strong limitations to this approach, but it, it's left and often left undiscussed, which is also where, why, you know, where I guess some of the heterodox economics also come from. Um, they're not necessarily presenting new pieces of research, but rather saying, hey, look, we need to be much clearer about our limitations or be more open about it. That 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 would be my short answer here. But yeah, I think that's very that's very difficult and delicate. But I think a useful exercise would be uh, um, before you even consider uh, some kind of construction through social, cultural, uh, gender factors, etc. So just put them on the side. Just stay within the positivist framework. If you are able to show them how much theory is already constraining what they consider data, how they analyze them, how they make methodological choices, if they get convinced by that, so within their proper framework, then you may have a door open to include these other much more complicated factors such as the, uh, the proper social construction or cultural relevance uh, and uh, etc. Um, and I don't think uh, it, it is uh, uh, it is a won a battle uh, yet, but somehow the the um, the dependence uh, on uh, theory is starting being recognized more. So if we continue kind of the discourse along those lines, so hopefully even the staunchest. Uh, positivist at some point will be able to kind of at least acknowledge that there is an implicit element that they are not even able themselves to see. But I think this is a matter of training and I, I've been more interested in talking to the kind of the junior, the, the younger generations rather than the old ones. So maybe I'm not so much interested in convincing the old staunch positivist. I'd rather try to convince the, the junior, the students now that these things are important. And so kind of change the strategy. Yes, thanks Federica. That's also very good for the last session that we are going to have on the teaching mixed method. Probably it's also something that we are going to talk uh, more about. Um, again, I mean, um, if, if I may uh, just uh, uh, um, uh, summarize a bit what, what is done is that uh, post -pos positivist and post positivism positivist have basically um, stopped asking themselves uh, uh, how data are generated and uh, uh, do not um, acknowledge that there is this relationship between them and the data. 
um, which um, probably is uh, so that they uh, well because if you think about it, it's it's easier to consider a social reality as an object because you don't have to make you extra questions about what your data means. So it's I think it's also a, a part of the um, one factor um, is the convenience of just considering. Uh, reality as, as separated from us instead of uh, uh, as compared to this relationship that we were talking about before. Um, Judith, you have a question to pose or a remark? Or yeah. a comment, yes. Well, uh, yes, perhaps a bit provocative, but um, uh, I think the idea of a reality out there is uh, very uh, problematic and but I must say I, I am not a uh, philosopher but I feel uh, inspired especially by what uh, Hilary Putnam has said uh, about that and I think there are uh, various various problems with the idea so for example the first problem being uh, that if we if we cannot grab the objective right reality, then uh, how can it uh, guide our, our research? I mean, that's then. Then I would say, okay, then we also uh, do not uh, do not need it. And uh, a second thing is that uh, uh, there are many things that did not exist, say, uh, uh, forty years ago. So, for example, uh, neural networks. How can you say that? neural networks uh, have have been there uh, in an objective uh, re reality no i think uh, before they were invented they simply they simply were not there and i think the important point that um, putnam uh, emphasized is um, uh, that it is the our basic concepts that are uh, constructed and that means that uh, by defining uh, specific concepts in a specific way we are creating a world it's not out there we are creating a world and then what we given that that we uh, adhere to specific rules and so we can discover something which we can call objective so in that sense we also do not even need the objective reality so for example once we define um the elements of a neural network in a specific way we can then uh investigate its properties but that does not mean that that reality uh, is there independent from our definition of its fun, uh, foundational concept. So I think the, the very important thing is to distinguish between foundational concepts that are constructed and then the world that is uh, uh, created through those um, uh, foundational concepts that uh, about which you cannot just say anything. So. Um, uh, yeah so but uh, the uh, and it this this has been called by um putnam uh, internal realism but i think that the the term realism is not exactly the right term because it it does not assume the uh independence existence of a of a world out there so that would be my point thank you thank you judith uh who wants to reply between uh, Federica and Lasse before also somebody else from the audience has, has a remark? But first, I would like to ask the two panelists. Yeah, maybe you did. Thanks. So um, you remind me that I should be looking back into Patman, which I haven't done in, uh, in ages, so partly because Patman is one of those philosophers who have the first, the second, third, the fourth uh, <clears throat> stage of his. Uh, <clears throat> complex philosophy, but um, I think there is one aspect of what you said that uh, really uh, was interesting to me, and that is this uh, kind of dynamic element of reality somehow. So one problem with uh, this uh, positivist view, uh, or really, or staunch relativist, it is as if we discover what reality is with data, and it is a once and for all thing, and it is not the case, uh, obviously. Um, that's that's where I find the, the the negotiation between us and out there 
important and interesting because it is never going to be the, the, the final world. Now, if we can agree on this basic idea, then I don't mind if this is labeled the critical realism, internal realism, uh, constructionism that would call uh, Floridian the philosophy of information. I think there may be good reasons to go for one or other labeling, but the, for me, the most important point is there is no inner and uh, solid and kind of a universal and immutable truth to be discovered. So I think I totally get your point. And maybe it wasn't uh, very explicit, at least in what I said, but I subscribe entirely. Thank you. Uh, Lasse, do you also want to add something or? Um... I kind of feel out of depth here because I, I would have to read Putnam for the first time, actually. So <laughs> I read another Putnam, but that, that doesn't relate to this. Um, I, so I so I will, not, I will not say too much about it because, uh, because I cannot comment on that particular point. I, what I can comment though is I, I, I work a lot with environmental scientists and and they they don't understand these questions at all. Um, they, you know, they would take me to a river and then say, is that water? And I say, yes, that is water. And does it make you wet? Yes, it does make me wet. And that's that's all they need to know, right? Um, that, then, of course, you can have a philosophical discussion about the question whether you should call this water and whether you should call wet wet as a sensation. Um, but it, in many ways, that is that's um, that's a that it's kind of like a high level conversation or such an abstract conversation that for, for many researchers is not 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 that much important. But again. So I'm not dismissing the idea because I need I, I need to study that better before I comment on it, but I I do get, also get the point that for some people uh, there is definitely uh, something out there that you can touch and, and and smell and feel and you can express to data. Uh, other than that, I very much agree with what Federica just said, and that that this world out there is changing. It it does, and uh, it it changes partially because we make inventions. That much is clear. And then when we invent something, then we have to build categories for that uh, in order to name it and 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 frame it in certain ways. That that much I understand. But um, yeah, no, I leave it at that for the moment. I I have a lot of reading to do. I recognize. Yes, as we all do, I guess, after uh, listening to, uh, to to this discussion. Uh, John um, has had his hand uh, uh, raised for a long time. Do, do you want to pose your question? No problem. Uh, what I originally wanted to say has already been said very eloquently to you others, so I won't go into that again. But reflecting on that, it comes to my mind that we are actually developing an interesting point in the conversation together. And that is that it's all about relations. It's relations between different researchers. It's also between the relation between each of these researchers and reality. Yeah, if we can say something like reality. Yeah, so uh, maybe it makes sense to, to at some stage explore a bit further precisely how one relation matters or does not matter, can matter or cannot matter for the other one should or should not matter for the other relations because it's all about that basic issue that's what comes to my mind if i may give sort of a quick impression here and share with you as a, as, a, as a relevant issue may i quickly reply to this i yes, yes. i thanks uh, john yes relations indeed so <clears throat> Um, I've been thinking a lot about that, and I guess this is also part of the problem of, uh, of these isolated debates that we have in philosophy of science. What is reality? Just reality. What is knowledge? Just knowledge. What is data? Just data. And, uh, uh, you know, but <laughs> that's not how it works, right? Because one thing that I took from the, the example of, of Lasse was that out of the many things he listened back in these recordings, some were data and some were not data. Why? Because he was listening to something with looking for something, uh, kind of a, a specific research question, right? And these uh, were possible because of the rough material, the recordings that in, that in turn was possible because he made all these kind of uh, translation from one format to, to another. So this is all about the relations in terms of the materiality, in terms of the epistemic agent in terms of uh, uh, what uh, the, the specific uh, item becomes data or does not become data and interpreted, etc. So uh, yes, I, I guess 
have been increasingly less interested in giving the perfect definition of any of the things that we have to discuss in philosophy of science and increasingly more interested in understanding how the things are related. So <clears throat> uh, I've, I've been working on causality for very, very long and then I realized that I haven't given any definition of causality because what I am interested in is understanding causality in methods with respect to the epistemic agents and for the purpose of policy, et cetera, or in terms of having evidence of mechanisms in some context. So it is always in this relational way that I, I, I think, and never because I want to pin down once and for all one of these things, uh, uh, what these things are. Uh, listening to this, that's really, that's really food for thought, so I'll think about it further. Thank you very much for your answer, uh, Federica. Um, it also came to, come, came to my mind that actually, of course, we're talking about three relations between research, data, and, if it exists, reality. Yeah, very, very much so. Yeah. Uh... I would add instruments as well, which, yes, means, exactly. uh, which may mean uh, instrumental equipment, uh, statistical methods, depending on what you are using. So for me, uh, yeah, I, I guess my, my triangle would be uh, so epistemic agents, uh, the world kind of thing, and, and uh, probably instruments uh, very broadly construed. And data is also part of this triangle because is the way in which you engage with the world, world with the instruments and some of the things that are there become data or do not become data, you have to explain why, et cetera. So for me, these would be the three, but I guess it's just a matter of understanding what you want to give more importance at any given moment of your explication of this complex process of knowledge production. And in the light of that, with an eye on the time, I know we're running out of time, but I want to pose this question still because there's a lot of complexity crowds here. If this is also true, if this, if we all buy into this argument, then what, what, what does it mean if people start working with simulated data in order to test their techniques and methods and, and, and ideas? I just want to drop that question here because I struggle with this. I see lots of people working with simulated data nowadays. Yeah, who wants, who would like to try to reply to <laughs> last uh, question? Exactly my question uh, by Daniela, I see in the chat. Please feel free to unmute yourself. Well, if I may, I mean, that's yes. precisely on this thing, uh, simulated data, there's a very lively debate among some QCA people. Uh, and uh, I think there is some consensus that you can use simulated data to show how the technique works. Um, but what you're really missing, and, and that's for QCA, but for other case-based methods is also, uh, an issue, you miss a connection with a real case. So in terms of how to interpret it and how to understand what it means, I think you're, you're drawing blanks. Um, so I am, I am very reserved when it comes to the usefulness of, of simulated data, particularly in a social science context. But I know there's lots of people who think very differently about that. Yes, me, I, yeah. Yeah, yes. No, I, I'm curious to hear what Daniela thinks because she said it's exactly also my question. So maybe she has some thoughts on this. Yeah, uh, yeah so I'm a scientist and I work on, on developing tools for machine learning and up unsupervised pattern mining. So for me, I really have now this constructed data world that influences what my methods are that we are developing. And so it trickles down to this entire evaluation problem that in the end we have. So are we evaluating how well our methods work on one particular data set, on a benchmark data set? Are we evaluating how good it works in real life, whatever real life is here? Um, are we comparing it to some ground truth that is constructed or not? So um, thank you for all of your input. I have many questions in my head and no answers anymore. <laughs> It is very tough indeed. I also we never said we would provide answers uh, though, so at least we are coherent with the description of the series. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> providing questions, thank you. Yeah. If you leave with more, uh, more questions than you came in the session, then that's a good thing. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, you, you did 
Yeah, I think we have time. Yeah, I, uh, there was one thing I would like to uh, say about what uh, 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 Federica and, and Lasse just said. I, I mean, they said something I think quite quite uh, similar that it's 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 about the the relations the relations between say the researcher the data. Um, the, the world out there, uh, if any, the, the instruments, etc. And to me, it sounded like both were kind of describing a, say, new materialist uh, research program. So I was wondering uh, whether you, you yeah, what, what your stance is um, uh, related to, to new materialism and um, how you differ from that or, or haven't considered or whatever. Thank you. What would be this new materialism, Judith? Yeah. I, yeah. No, I mean, is there a new materialism and uh, that I don't know of? And the question well, is whether what uh, I said is going in that direction? Yes, uh, I, I mean, the uh, uh, people like uh, uh, Karen Barra, uh, Barrett, uh, for example. Okay. As, uh, yeah, OK, yes, like, yes, okay. yes, OK, no, definitely, yes. I. I've been engaging with the work of uh, Karen Barad uh, lately quite a lot, and uh, I find myself in uh, much, much agreement with many of her arguments. <clears throat> uh, what I've been trying to develop lately, <clears throat> excuse me, is more epistemologically oriented than uh, her own work. But I can definitely uh, relate with her point that uh, the material aspects of research matter. And it matters uh, in terms of the agency that we have and also these instruments have. So yes, uh, yes, broadly, then we can work out exactly the details of what she's uh, specifically interested in or I am interested in. But broadly, I, I think this is a very important work that we should uh, read and, uh, and discuss uh, uh, more. Also because in my view, uh, Karen Barad is not uh, reducing everything, everything to materiality. And, uh, and so uh, it becomes a kind of a, a very rough materialism. It is a very sophisticated form of materialism in which epistemic agents have a very important role. Theory has important role. So yes, maybe there is also a, um, an, an exercise of translation into the vocabulary of other circles that has to be done. But as such, uh, uh, yes, I'm glad that you brought it up because for me, it is very relevant. Yeah, likewise, I, I, I very much agree. It's been brought up in a, in a conversation some, some months ago when we were at, by a colleague when we talked about the same topic and they start reading into it and uh, there was a lot that resonated strongly. Absolutely, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we are almost uh, uh, done with the one hour session, but uh, Barry had a question, maybe, I, I don't know if it's... Um, uh, it'll, it'll be tough to squeeze it in the two minutes, but I'll try. So just in, in response to, to Lassie's question and, and, and the question of simulation of data. So I, I work in, uh, my field is software engineering. Um, and there we go from very, very clearly constructive uh, constructivist ideas of what is it, what is a requirement, what is risk, um, and the things that are very heavily tinged by bias um, into a more positivist, uh, we transfer into a more positivist approach and say we have this thing that we've built and we can test it and see if it works. And as soon as we put these things into reality in software engineering, we realize that they don't work and that constructivist view, constructed view of the world, the constructed data in that process uh, just doesn't agree with, with the reality that's there. And my research is actually using random simulation. So instead of asking what's a requirement or what's a risk, we just make stuff up um, and we make it up in huge volumes and take away the bias that that positivist approach actually brings into the, the design of software. And so my research is focused on when we do this, it works. And so I'm trying to figure out why, why does this actually work? So it's, it's been really, really relevant to today. But that that's a very interesting one um, that it works, but we don't know we don't know how and why. Yeah. That's that is very interesting. Do you have any hunch as to why why it, it it kind of seems to work the way you wanted it? Yes, I just I'm writing a paper on it right now, so um, it's uh, it's somewhere in between Monte Carlo simulations, Kaufman networks, and attractors. 
Um, and I'm trying to use something called category theory and mathematics to describe that, which is quite nice and loose and allows things to be a, a little bit off and odd and, and not as, as stringent as other mathematical methods. But uh, I think that the whole thing leans on the fact that there are attractors in these complex, complex networks and, and they save us and that the attractor network in the real world or in, in the in the social world is so much bigger than the attractor network in the software world that you can loop around in a random walk and revisit things over and over and over again. That's my logic. That, that's my theory as to, as to, as to why this keeps working all the time. Right now. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. I would be happy to, to see that paper at some point. It would yeah. be great. Yeah. Yeah, uh, indeed. And I think that with this uh, uh, last example, it's a, a perfect way, way to close because it made me think how uh, it, um, um, it's quite useful to think about maybe this continuum between objectivity and subjectivity when we think about the, the nature of data and that we have to keep a balance in a way along this relationship that we have with our data and in this triangle of knowledge measurement and data that that we were talking about uh, just before maybe it's a kind of like a buddhist middle path of uh, academic research maybe i don't know so with that i um, thank um, very much the two panelists so uh, federica and Lasse, and also uh, all the participants and also in particular the ones that that, that, that shared their thoughts and made great remarks and questions um, we are going to um, close the session now uh, and uh, see uh, us again uh, in uh, two weeks for the session on uh, big data. So maybe it's, uh, I think it will be a good uh, um, leap um, uh, with this session. So uh, thank you very much again to all. And just just as a reminder for everyone, if you want to join yeah. next session, you have to register again because the registration yeah. goes session by session. Yes, thank you for reminding that, uh, Lasse, indeed. So please register again <laughs> and see you next time, hopefully. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Ciao, bye. ciao. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.